and what gives it the value is this thing called the interest rate. It is the charge to pay to borrow someone's money. That interest rate is typically paid in arrears, meaning at the end of the month is when it's calculated. Maybe due at the beginning where it would be called interest in advance. Most lenders always charge the interest rate in arrears, meaning whatever happens, you pay the principal and interest, you pay the principal first, then the interest is calculated. Now, there is a law that allows or disallows lenders to charge too much. There is a maximum that a lender can charge on the interest. That is called the usury laws. Highlight that, circle it, do whatever you want. <clears throat> so that would be the maximum that like Visa can put on your rate would be the interest rate. The usury law says it might be 31%. Now here's the big kick in the ding ding for all of this. This usury law is actually exempts uh, residential first lien mortgages. So there really is no maximum a lender could charge because the usury laws do not apply to mortgages. They apply to like credit cards or rent a center or one of those loan payday places. They don't apply to the first lien. So theoretically, you go see that lender and he's going to go, yeah, well, the interest rate we charge is uh, 18%. There's no law on that. It's just up to him to determine that the market's going to go, well, we're not going to use you. And they're going to eventually go out of business. And that is called the free market capital system. All right. <clears throat> so now. I'm going to let you guys <clears throat> in on a secret. I'm going to dispel a myth. I'm going to burst your bubble. There is no Santa Claus, right? And there is no Easter Bunny. Here's the next myth. Banks don't have money, right? Everybody thinks banks have money. They don't. Banks don't have money. Bank investors have money. BlackRock has money. Teachers Credit Union has money. Banks don't have money. Banks are a system that is designed to assess your credit and decides who gets their investors' money. So that's the lender. They don't have money. All right. <clears throat> they use other people's money. Now, there's an old 70s or 80s sitcom called the Beverly Hillbillies. If you've heard of it, you will guess or understand this analogy. If you've never heard of the Beverly Hillbillies, I would suggest you maybe you YouTube or Google and look at it. The premise behind this TV series was a comedy TV series. It was a funny, humorous uh, sitcom. But the actual premise behind it is a very strong financial premise. In the sitcom, there was this guy from Kentucky named Jed Clampett who found oil on his property. And all of a sudden, he became very rich. Well, all his family said, well, you're rich. You need to live in Beverly Hills. And the whole premise behind the sitcom, which made it funny, was a bunch of hillbillies from backwoods, Kentucky, living in the highfalutin area of Beverly Hills, California. <clears throat> but in the series, there was this reoccurring character called Mr. Drysdale, who was the president of the bank. And he always, in every episode, played a role, but was always trying to kiss Jed Clampett's butt. And, oh, yeah, you're the smartest, you're the best, and help them out of all these funny situations. The premise is, why was Mr. Clampett, the president of the bank, always kissing Jed Clampett's butt? Because Mr. Uh, <clears throat> Drysdale's bank didn't have money. 
it was Jed Clampett's $300 million he put into the bank that allowed the bank to make loans. The bank is great at assessing risk. They determine who got the money, but it wasn't their money. It was the teacher's credit union. It was BlackRock Investment Group. It was Penn Life Insurance. Those are the true investors into a bank. So banks can make money in several ways. The first way they make money is this thing called a loan origination fee. Now, it is exactly what it sounds like it is. It is the fee a bank would charge to originate or start the loan for that consumer. There are expenses that have to be covered in creating a loan. Somebody's got to pay the person that actually writes down the information. Somebody's got to pay that person. That person's salary in the bank would be covered by a loan origination fee. That loan origination fee is the math that we're going to talk about. So a loan origination fee, you will hear it always expressed in the term, well, let's just make it singular for right now, a point. So the loan origination fee is a point, a point and a half, half a point, two points, however that, whatever the bank tells you where a point is defined as 1% of the loan amount. Very crucial you understand it's that number, not the purchase price. There's going to be a trick on the exam to try and get you to fall for this. So if a person borrows $150,000, and that bank charges them one point, that is 1% one of $150,000. Or 1500 dollars Right? 1% one of 150000 is $1,500. So not only are they borrowing 150,000, they now have to pay 1500 to get the right to borrow that 150. Some lenders will allow you to roll that into the loan. So in, ex in essence, they're borrowing 151,500 because they got to pay 1500 in loan origination fees. And we can play this game all day. It could be one and a half points. It could be two points. It could be uh, half a point. Some lenders will actually say it's zero points. They don't charge for that. So that might be a factor that your client's looking at is are there loan origination fees? Now, there's one other thing I need to jump over here and talk about that we haven't touched on yet, but it's going to become very important. There is another ratio that a lender will look at. It is called the loan to value ratio. The loan amount divided by the value of the property. This is what I was telling you when that lender is loaning 250, they want the house to be at least 250 because that would be a 100% loan to value. The LTV is the slang for this or loan to value. So let's do an example. Let's say a person wants to borrow $150,000. That is the loan amount. The appraiser goes out and says this property is worth 
$1,000. So in essence, this borrower is borrowing a loan to value of 150 divided by 200, and that is three fourths, or it's expressed as 75% loan to value. They want a 75% loan to value. Let's do another math example just so you guys can get used to this. Let's say I want to borrow $185,000 and the property is appraised at $225,000. Hit pause, do the math, and come back and tell me what the loan to value on this is. All right, are you back? <clears throat> if you did this math correctly, you will see it's about an 82% loan to value. I think the number came out to be 82.22, and I'm, I apologize. I did not do the math in event. I just made those numbers up. But it's about an 82% loan to value. That's going to be important because, remember, if a bank wants to use that house as collateral, they need to understand that this loan to value is less than 100. I want to do one more <clears throat> just because I've never done this in class and I think it might be important for you guys to see. So let's say we want to borrow a borrow 150. This should be easy math. But the appraisal comes in at 100,000. This is actually three halves. Did you guys know that six out of five people don't understand fractions? Or 150%. <clears throat> There's no bank in the world that's ever going to loan this. And this is why we go back to that number three with the appraisal. When I said the house has to be at least, if it was 150, now it comes out at 100% loan to value. That's the highest any bank's ever going to loan. They're not going to loan more than the property's worth. And because the LTV, the loan to value, would be over 100. And the bank is not going to loan that. Now, we need to know this. And let's go back to this example of points. So let's do another example about points. Let's say... You go into the bank and go, hey, Mr. Bank, I am borrowing or I am buying a house at 250 at an 80% loan to value. And the bank says, well, that's cool. <clears throat> to do this loan, we're going to charge you one point for loan origination fee. So my question to you is how much is that consumer paying in the loan origination fee? Hit pause and come right back. All right, you're back. So remember that the loan origination fee is a point on the loan amount. This is where the test is going to trick you. So in this question right here, we need to figure out, because I told you the purchase was 250 but their loan is only 80% of that. So we need to figure out the loan amount. If there's 250 is the purchase price times the loan, 80%, I can't do math, <laughs> is $200,000 is the loan amount. Now we would say, okay, the lender's charging one point of the loan amount, so the loan origination fee would just be $2,000 on that loan. 
Make sure you understand this math. If you don't, email me. I'm at Raymond at realuniversity.com because it's important you understand the question may be different. The first question we asked, was, or the first question was, I told you we were going to borrow 150000 at one point. That's why we got 1500 The second question I asked you was, we are going to buy a house at this loan value. So you had to calculate the loan amount first. Then you calculated the purchase, the loan origination fee to get that number. Make sure you understand the difference in those two questions, because I guarantee one or the other or both might be on the exam. The key you need to remember is loan origination fee is defined as 1% of the loan amount, not the purchase price, not the appraised value, not what you want it to be worth, not what Santa Claus said it was worth. It's of the loan amount. So this is the first way that a lender can make money is through this thing called a loan origination fee. All right.